Hi YouTube, this is going to be a video on the build I used for Asterian during my playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. I found it extremely powerful, especially around when you get level 8, midway through Act 2. You're going to be shooting out so many attacks that frankly I found it kind of unfair, even on Tactician difficulty. So I ended up benching Asterian for a different member, just to make the game a little more difficult for myself, and I only brought him back in to finish up his story quest in Act 3. So starting off, Asterion is a rogue when you find him, so I wanted to keep him as a rogue. And starting as a rogue, of course, you get bonus skill proficiencies, which is always really nice to have. For stats, you want to have a high dexterity and a decent constitution. The last one, I bumped intelligence for some sort of uh, late game benefits you'll find out later. Obviously, it's going to be a wizard level, which is the only reason you really bump intelligence. Um... But if you want to have it be more of a face, if you or Asterion is the one who's talking to people, you'd want to bump your Charisma score up a little more. If you don't want to go for a Wizard Dip at the end, you can shift the Intelligence points over to Wisdom, or you could add a little Constitution if you wanted a little more HP. However, I played him mostly as a ranged rogue, and I found that the HP stat wasn't as important as some of the other characters, even if you are going to be doing a little bit of spellcasting. But... Just choose whatever you'd like. I tried to get at least 16, 14 for Dexterity Constitution on the start. For skill proficiencies, you're going to want to get Acrobatics. Acrobatics, of course, as a dex-based character, is going to help us resist being shoved. Asterion starts off with Sleight of Hand and Deception. These are two very good ones. Deception, of course, for more of a talking role, but Sleight of Hand is going to be your lockpicking, your trap disarming, uh, any sort of sneaking stuff that isn't directly tied to the stealth skill is going to be sleight of hand. And then of course stealth is for stealth. Another thing I like to get here is perception, however as a high elf, Asterion just gets this for free, which is great. As a rogue you start off with a ton of skills, so a lot of this is just going to be pick what you like. Uh, I like athletics just in case the, there's an off chance you shove someone, even though you're not going to have very high strength score, it's better than nothing, just in case. And for proficiencies, I like having sleight of hand if you're having him be your main lockpicking person in the party, and either stealth or perception, depending on if you're going to be sneaking a lot or you want to have a higher perception score for your party. Uh, but the last skill here is pretty much just choose whatever you like. One of the face skills, of course, is excellent if you're going to be a face person. Insight's also pretty good as a, a face skill. Uh, I, of course, like double dipping on stuff, so since I'm putting more in intelligence, investigation here is what I go for. Now, continuing with the levels we're going to be taking, we're going to keep going in Rogue for a little bit, and if you've seen a couple, you know, Asterian builds, you probably know where we're going with this, if we're going to go to a level 3 rogue in order to get our subclass. The cunning action here are really good, especially dash early on, it lets you move around the battlefield a lot. Disengage is situationally useful, as is the hide, although the hide is very good for pickpocketing, because if you can hide as a bonus action, then within one round of a uh, time stop, you can Cutting action hide, pickpocket with your full action, run away, and then unfreeze time all in one good sweep. So, at Rogue 3, you have a couple options for your subclass. I think all three of them are pretty good. Personally, I went with the Thief because we're going to be dual wielding, so you're offhand, you get an additional bonus action, mostly for offhand attacks. You can use it for a bunch of other things, but having two that you pretty much are always going to have a use for is very strong. Assassin is more so if you want to be stealth engaging a lot of enemies or, like the name says, assassinating people as the amount of damage you're going to be able to do, especially in a first round or even just to one-shot enemies because you get guaranteed crits on anyone who's been surprised, in addition to getting advantage on your attack rolls and restoring your action and bonus action because in BG3 when you engage combat from stealth, if you're seen or you don't kill them, you will lose the action that you use to engage that sort of combat with. However, with Assassin's Alacrity, you immediately get them all back. And then, of course, Arcane Trickster has the benefit of um, making an invisible mage hand on top of getting a few uh, 
uh, spell progression levels, but personally it's a little weaker than the other two. However, if you'd want to sort of lean more into the, the caster or just play around with Mage Hand a lot, this is still a great option. So I ended up going with Thief, just for generic power. And then that's all the levels in Rogue we're going to be taking. Unfortunately, going further into Rogue is pretty bad. The level 5 Rogue ability, how it works in Baldur's Gate 3, is it's a passive you turn on and then will immediately eat your reaction for the first instance of damage you take, which is not at all how it works in the tabletop, and losing your reaction for such a meager bonus, bonus, not being able to wait for the hardest hitting thing to cut in half is just really bad. Evasion's good, but you'd have to go all the way to level 7 as a Rogue to get it, and that's just a bit tough. So instead, we're going to be going into a ranger, as I wanted. To, I was playing more of a uh, ranged rogue. And for the initial ranger features, the favorite enemy, you can take pretty much whatever you'd like here. Just pick your favorite um, proficiency. Their ensnaring strike isn't very good, I found. It requires your bonus action, your action, and your concentration, so you're effectively using three attacks for it, and it's going to be based on a, a save based on your wisdom modifier to do only a little more damage and ensnare them. Ensnare is powerful, but regardless of how you build Asterion, you're never really going to have a very high spell DC for it, so I personally, I wouldn't worry about the effect here. I would just pick your favorite uh, proficiency skill you want to get. Ranger Knight, we're not going to be using Heavy Armor. As a dex maxing character, you actually get better AC from Medium Armor than you will Heavy Armor. Um, and none of the skills are particularly powerful. Uh, Protect from Evil and Good have some situational uses, so you can pick that here, but it doesn't particularly matter. For Natural Explorer, I like taking Beast Tamer. The Familiar is very powerful. There's a lot of utility with the different types you can use, specifically the Cat to set up for AoEs, the Raven for flying in and out of combat and giving you easy sneak attack advantage at... Uh, procs. Um, the, the frog's really good if you have a bunch of deck saves on your characters, etc. Alternatively, because Asterion's background already gives sleight of hand, you can pick one of the resistances. Fire is extremely common. Cold and poison a little less so. And then for abilities, you're just going to uh, pick from these couple ones. I'm just going to go for survival hero because it's a nice thing to be able to succeed on your survival checks in the wild. Level 2 Ranger, we're going to start getting some spells to use. In addition to a fighting style for the spells, I would definitely pick up Hunter's Mark. Now, Hunter's Mark, the damage isn't the main benefit here, as you can make an offhand attack with your bonus action. So unless you are specifically trying to whittle down a higher health boss type enemy, which there are a couple, especially in Act 1, that you may struggle with. And then the 1d6 damage will start adding up, especially early on. The main benefit here is being able to concentrate on a day-length spell, essentially, until the next long rest, and that will trigger a ring that you can find in Act 1 to just give you consistent damage on all of your attacks. Some other good spells are Goodberry, it's a nice sort of out-of-combat heal that you can use to keep your party topped up. Fog Cloud's a nice blind obscure thing you can get that doesn't involve any saving throws or anything. It lets you pick pocket merchants in broad daylight. daylight it's pretty good. Uh, speak with animals i wouldn't really pick because you have limited slots and it's very easy to get potions for this long stride is really good if you don't have access to it in your party because 10 movement speed or three meters is a lot of movement speed especially early on when your characters aren't going to be as mobile as they will later and then if you don't, again if you don't have access to it enhanced sleep is a really good sort of traversal skill because it's a ritual and then for the fighting style we're gonna go with archery here because i wanted to go for a ranged build Level 3 Ranger, we're going to pick a subclass. Again, all of these subclasses are pretty good. My personal favorite was the Gloomstalker, both for the additional AC that you get on top of a free attack that doesn't use an action or anything on the start of combat. Plus 3 Initiative is really good because Initiative is rolled with a 1d4 in Baldur's Gate 3 as opposed to the 1d20 in Tabletop, which means you're almost always going to be going first, coupled with your very high dexterity score. In addition, you also get some great spells. Disguise Self is a ritual, which means it doesn't cost anything outside of combat, so you can use this to avoid being caught while pickpocketing. You can disguise yourself as a smaller race to fit into tiny holes and crevices, and then later on you get the very powerful Misty Step in the as a Gloomstalker spell, which is very powerful in combat to teleport around and reposition yourself. 
Additionally, the Beastmaster is pretty strong. It's not going to be as strong as it would be if you were going full Ranger, because we'll only get up to the level 5 Beastmaster features. However, it's still very strong, and you can feel free to play along with it if you wanted to have more of like a Menagerie style with Tina Familiar and a Companion. And then Hunter is also pretty good as far as the combat benefits you can get. I believe Colossus Slayer and Horde Breaker are both pr pretty good. Giant Slayer is alright, but we will be able to find a way to make reaction attacks later, so it's less important. So I ended up going with Gloomstalker just because I really like the spells and the bonus to initiative here. And then again, you get more spells here, which is usually pretty good. Now we're going to go keep going with Ranger all the way to level 5. As you would expect, most martial classes you want to go all the way to level 5 on at least one class that knows extra attack. We're going to get a feat here, and personally, I bumped up my dexterity score with some gloves you can find in Act 1 around level 4 or 5 if you can beat the prerequisite fight in order to get to the mountain pass for the crash area. One of the vendors there will sell you gloves that will bump your dexterity up to 18 in addition to giving you plus one to attack. So effectively for accuracy, it will bump your attack all the way up to as if you had a 20 dexterity, which frees us up to both use feats on different things as opposed to just ability for improvements and to not have to kind of gun for feats as we're leveling up. However, if you want to invest the uh, Hag's Hair plus one bonus into Asterian, or if you're playing this for your main character, then you can actually start with a 17 here, get the plus one for the hag's hair, and then cap out your ability score uh, with pl into plus 20. However, even if you took the hag's hair, you'd be sitting pretty at 18 dexterity, and I would still take this feat, which is the sharpshooter feat. The sharpshooter feat lets you ignore low ground, which is nice every now and then, but more importantly, it gives you the same as great weapon master, which is minus five to your attack roll. However, you get a flat plus 10 to damage, which is huge, especially because we are going to be dual wielding hand crossbows and firing off four, maybe more uh, attacks per round. And you can just leave this on because as early as pretty much the start of Act 2, a uh, little further in, but very early on, you're going to be able to mitigate this minus five very easily. Now we get our final level of Ranger, level 5. Of course, this gives us access to both extra attack and level 2 spells, the most important of which being the Gloomstalker spell, Misty Step, which is extremely powerful because it's a bonus action, no concentration, teleport. Additionally, you get access to two more spells here, a couple ones I want to point out. Spike Growth, extremely powerful. Concentration over a huge area. It lasts a huge amount of time, but you're usually just going to need it for combat, and it'll be all of combat. The way this works is you create a giant ground area of spiked ground and it'll have the movement speed of anyone inside of it. Notably, it's not difficult terrain, so any features they have that negate difficult terrain won't affect to it. In addition, it also stacks with difficult terrain, so if you would stack this and then had, say, a druid cast plant growth in that area, you would be able to uh, quarter the movement of anyone inside of it. Additionally, every five feet they move, they will be taking 2d4 piercing damage, flat, no save, no anything. So. If you have a way to continuously push them back, even if you just sit on the edge with your front line and shove them back into it, it's a lot of damage that can add up pretty much throughout the entire game. I would also recommend just for utility to change out a spell here, uh, either Fog Cloud or Long Strider or whatever you would pick there. Or if you found you just don't ever use Hunter's Mark, you can additionally take that one out as well. And the other spell I would take here would be Pass Without Trace. This is another day-long concentration spell that applies to your entire party in a small area of effect, where until your next long rest, you just concentrate this for the whole day, and you get a flat plus 10 to stealth checks, which is absurd because of how a sort of the bounded D20 system works. A flat plus 10 is ridiculously powerful, and it lets even your party members with heavy armor that have disadvantage succeed on a good chunk of stealth checks as long as they have some sort of cover. Another thing to mention here is the silence spell. If you for some reason don't want to use the spike growth or pass without trace, silence is a nice ritual spell that lets you sort of sneak or break into things a lot easier because you won't be making any sound. However, if you cast any it on any target, it'll actually trigger combat or turn them hostile, so do be aware of that. It is a ritual spell, so you don't have to spend a spell slot on it, which is why I wanted to point it out as well. Now the build's mostly online. You're going to be halfway through or so 
Act 2, and you're going to have four attacks per round via extra attack and your two bonus action offhand attacks. Additionally, you have a bunch of other uses for your bonus action, and you get a free attack when you start the round. If you're playing Assassin, you also get an additional attack from your uh, main hand action, and then extra attack, and then potentially even another bonus action attack. So you're really layering it up here, and if you have a character that can cast haste, Asterion's definitely one of the best people to have haste on him, especially with the flat plus 10 to every attack and extra attack. From this point, you have a couple ways you want to build. I think we're done with Ranger and we're done with Rogue. So you can either, if you want to keep it very simple, keep it, play as a fighter, just four points in fighter to get your subclass and an extra feat. All of the fighter subclasses are very powerful. Champion's very simple. It just increases your critical strike range. Uh, Battlemaster, when you get it, the actual spell DCs on your battle maneuvers aren't going to be very good because of how high the stats are for the Act 3 players, uh, NPC, sorry. But it's still a great thing to have because you're going to be getting a bunch of battle maneuver dice to add a 1d8 damage to your attacks, which you can potentially use on crits and stuff. And finally, the Arcane Fighter. Um, you can acquire the Shield Spell, which is a very powerful level 1 spell, in addition to adding to your uh, spellcasting progression, so you'll get more spell slots that way. Personally, what I would do if you wanted to make it a little more complicated is take three levels in Bard. Now, you could potentially respec as early as level 9 into six levels of Bard, and then three levels of Rogue, three levels of Ranger. This would also get your extra attack. However, it would make your Bardic Dice refresh on a short rest and give you a little more spell passing progression. You would lose out on any other potential feat here, which means if you're going Hag's Hair, you would be stuck at 18 Dexterity. If you were looking to maybe get the Lucky Dice or something, you wouldn't be able to do that. What I actually like doing is taking three levels of Bard and then one level of Wizard, and I'll show you why. So for the Bard, you're going to start off picking some cantrips. You're never really going to use Vicious Mockery because we already have actions for our bonus action and our regular action for attacks. We're never really going to want to use that. We're just going to want to be shooting things. Blade Ward's okay. It's something you consider. Mage Hand's pretty good. Uh, personally, I like taking things that don't have concentration, like Minor Illusion and Mage Hand. For the spells, as a bard, Charisma is going to be your casting, so you're not really going to have much healing or uh, damage or spell DC. That said, Healing Word's still an excellent pickup because you're still going to be able to heal as a bonus action at a very long range, which is great for picking up an, uh, one of your allies or just curing uh, maimed or wounded off of them or bleeding. And I would take off some of these. I think I already have heroism. Uh, you can take some other ritual spells like Featherfall um, and anything here you'd like, really. The starting instrument, there's a, a lyre in Act 2 that has some potential use, but by the time you get this, it's mostly just going to be a flavor pick, so just pick whatever you'd like. Uh, for your ability score, of course, you get another ability here. I personally like taking religion, as there's a really powerful religion check in Act 3 that is uh, DC 25, so it's good to be able to try and make that. Or save scum if you're willing to save scum for that and make it a little easier on yourself. However, if you're playing like more of a face, you definitely want to take another one of these uh, face charisma options. We're going to keep going with our bard levels here. As a level 2 bard, we're going to get Jack of All Trade, which is notably less powerful on this build than it is on some others, considering because of our multi-class options, we have so many skills that are, we are proficient in, but it will still apply to a couple of the skills that may occasionally come up. Additionally, we also get Song of Rest, which is just an additional short rest. And we get another spell here, which you can take whatever you'd like. Finally, as a level 3 bard, we get access to level 2 bard spells in addition to our subclass. First things first, we're going to pick our subclass, and that is going to be the College of Swords. The benefit of the College of Swords is you get a fighting style in addition to these uh, flourishes, which are essentially the same as maneuvers, but they use your bardic inspiration dice, of which you're going to have 4 and 3 long rest. Again, if you would swap to the 633 with 6 bard, then they would recharge on a... Uh, short rest instead of a long rest and be 1d8s. That's a build decision I would let, I'd leave up to you. The 
powerful one here is going to be Slashing Flourish. Currently the way this works is you can, because it's a ranged attack for some reason, target the same enemy twice, as opposed to the melee one can only target two separate enemies. I'm not sure if that's a range issue or just the way they coded it. If it ever gets changed, it's still a very strong ability to have because there's almost always going to be more than one enemy. And unlike the melee one, you don't have to be in melee range, you just have to be in ranged range, which is a lot easier. Additionally, the mobile flourish is very powerful because you can push something back 20 feet regardless of its size. Very good to combo with the spike growth if you still want to use a cheese grater like that. You can also use it to teleport around if that's something you like. And then finally, the defensive flourish is very good because our... AC sort of capped off at uh, when we finished getting our armor. So even at the start of Act 3, when you get a slight upgrade to that, we're still going to have relatively low AC, around 21 or so, compared to uh, what potentially would be a lot higher AC. And it might be something you'd want to do if there's a ton of enemies you might be targeting you as well. For the fighting style, we're going to pick up two, wedding fi two weapon fighting. This allows you to add your uh, modifier to your offhanded attacks. However, this currently is bugged with the um, hand crossbow for some reason, and it already applies the modifier, but whenever that does get fixed, uh, if it ever does, and I would imagine it does because it's pretty clearly a bug, uh, then this would allow you to add your dexterity modifier to your offhand attacks. Finally, for spells, nothing too important here because we're not going to have a very high DC. Uh, a couple ones I would normally, you could pick up silence here, Detect Thoughts is really powerful, however, in because of the nature of the campaign for Baldur's Gate 3 in particular, it's a lot less pow powerful because you may have this already on your main character throughout the course of the game. It just gets given to you somewhat. Um, Stay Invisibility is good if you don't have uh, an option for this. It does use a spell slot, but it lasts until the long rest. It's just a buff you can apply. Knock is pretty powerful as you can use it to block off areas of a battlefield when you're fighting inside. Invisibility is great for uh, sneaking around in uh, broad daylight. However, this will use your uh, spell slot, so keep that in mind. Unfortunately, some of these more powerful saves we have, like Hold Person and Crown of Madness, we aren't going to have a very high spell save DC for. An additional thing you could consider is Cloud of Daggers. It does twice as much damage as the Spike Growth. However, it's a much smaller area, and it only applies to 4d6. It doesn't actually scale with how much they're being moved around. Additionally, swap out another earlier spell for an additional level 2 bard spell. Now, the, for the final option, you can either continue as a bard. This will give you a feat, it'll give you another cantrip, and it will improve your spell casting progression so that you get a little more spell slots, specifically level 4 spell slot. However, it doesn't actually give you any level 4 spells, as you're only a level 4 in Bard, particularly. Some good feats to take here are the um, Lucky feat. Lucky gives you 3 luck points, which is essentially 3d20s that you can use throughout the day to reroll something. It's very powerful. Something else you could consider is Crossbow Expert. If you find yourself in melee range a lot, it'll remove the disadvantage from that. Um, other than that, I would consider potentially the ability score improvement to cap out your dexterity if you had previously taken the hag's hair and you wanted to do it now would be the time uh, alternatively you could take a magic adept to get access to the shield spell however what i would do instead is what i'm going to do and why we started off with such a high intelligence is take one level in wizard Taking one level of wizard allows you to not only have access to a couple of the spells at the start, but also allows you to scribe any spell you can find as a scroll, which most of them can be found as a scroll in the wild, and scribe up to the level of spell slots that you have. Notably, this will be up to level 4, so we'll be able to get powerful spells such as Haste at level 3, Greater Invisibility at level 4, um, Shield at level 1 and other good stuff. So hunt around, find. It's not gonna be as in-depth as the Shadow Heart ones that I talked about earlier because you're only gonna have access to level four spell slots as a mostly martial character. However, there's still a lot of utility to be found. For cantrips, uh, just take whatever you'd like and don't already have. As we're already having access to ranged attacks, there's no real need to get them here. So for example, you could take Blade Ward, Friends, and Light, and then you'd have access to all three of those. For initial spells, too, I would look at 
would be specifically shield. I wasn't able to find, uh, to, to my memory, a scroll of this in the wild, and it is one of the most powerful things you'd want to get, especially at this level when we have plenty of level 1 spell slots to burn. Being able to use shield as a reaction, A, gives you another use for your reaction, as opposed to just opportunity attacks and an action that we'll get from an item later. It also lets you increase your armor class by 5 for the entire round, which can not only improve your defenses, but also make you a lot less likely to be targeted, as a lot of the tactician AI enemies target based on their range and the AC of the uh, player characters they could be targeting. Other powerful ones are Fog Cloud, if you didn't get it earlier, Find Familiar, if you didn't get it earlier, uh, from the uh, from the Ranger. Uh, much of the bunch of these have uh, kind of fallen off on scaling because of uh, what level you're at, but some no-save ones are like Magic Missile, Enhanced Sleep, uh, Expeditious, uh, whatever. False Life is good because you can upcast it if you'd like. And then as a level 1 wizard, we're going to get 4 uh, spell slots to prepare, which is a good chunk. I found generally you only need around 3, 4. Uh, some powerful ones. Let's see if I have any learned here. I don't believe I do, because I ended up taking a staring out of the party. But some powerful ones would be, um, if you can find it, Counterspell. I don't believe I managed to find any. Um, however... It's definitely powerful if you can find a way to get access to it. I just couldn't find any scrolls through my playthrough, so it might be locked behind um, uh, like class exclusive. They wanted to keep it, so they didn't make any scrolls of it. Or it could just be that they didn't program a way to use reactions, so they didn't bother put it in as a uh, scroll. Animate Dead's another one you can learn. There's another no concentration if you want to summon some zombies. That's sort of in lore for Asterion, especially if you decide to ascend him at the end of the game. Uh, slow is another powerful one, however it is a, uh, a spell DC, so you might not be able to land it. Or, uh, what was the other one? Uh, knock is another one if you really want to enhance your abilities as uh, a, sort of a roguish type. You can, uh, you are going to be able to succeed on most of your lockpicking checks at this point, but if you really can't do it, uh, this is another option at the final level. Fly is good if you want a way to fly around and to use your concentration on that. Um, but you already have access to Misty Step and Shield, so I pretty much hunt for Haste and Greater Invisibility, and anything else is just sort of icing on the cake, and then I would prepare those four. Uh, uh, I guess you already have Misty Step, so you get a, a third one. Finally, for items, I'm going to try and go through these as quick as I can, because it's fairly simple. Um, at the start of the game, or actually, I guess elixirs. So let's do elixirs first. You're going to want to use elixir of bloodlust. There's no other options here. You don't have a reliable way to get temporary hit points, so that can serve as some free healing for you. But the more important thing is you are a fully offensive character that is not using strength, which means you want elixir of bloodlust. You also don't really care about your spell DCs as you're mostly martial based, so you don't want to use battle mage or anything. I would just go for bloodlust here. The additional action is insanely powerful, especially when you're going to be starting off combat going first with an additional attack from Gloomstalker. You're going to be able to proc this super easily because you're going to have so many attacks in the first round. You should easily be able to guarantee a kill on something, which gives you another two attacks. For helmets in Act 1, pretty much use whatever you like. I found the uh, this helmet that you can get from doing some quests in the Mushroom Colony is pretty strong. Uh, essentially, it lets you, uh, I think it's a short rest, just you can be invisible for two turns. This is pretty good because it doesn't use a spell slot and it lets you pickpocket people in the middle of nowhere. I didn't find it particularly powerful for combat, but it's certainly something that you could consider if you really had to use your action for something. In Act 2, you can go right to Moonrise Towers and buy this. There's a lot of things you're going to get at the Moonrise Towers vendors, so I would recommend beelining there if you want to have Asterion as your main damage dealer or if you're playing this build on your own. The Marksmanship app you can buy gives you a plus one to attack, uh, attack rolls and thrown attack rolls. I believe it's only supposed to apply to ranged attack rolls. Uh, I never checked to see if it worked on melee or not, but you're going to be ranged attacking mostly. So a plus one to the rolls is really powerful, especially because this is going to be about the time that you're going to get the sharpshooter feet and start looking to increase your accuracy a lot more. Finally, in Act 3, you have a couple options. As soon as you get to Baldur's Gate, you can sneak into the top of the Devil Sea and get this. I think this is the best in slot helm, in my opinion. You get the Detect Slot spell for three, which is just okay. Um, you, Based on the nature of the uh, campaign, 
it's a lot less powerful, like I said, than it would have normally be. However, plus two to attack rolls, initiatives, and perception checks are all things you want, so I think this helm is the best. The only downside is, as you'll see, the helm honestly looks terrible, as opposed to the marksmanship hat, which looks fantastic. The other two helms that are options are Helm of Grit. These are both in Act 3. If you are willing to keep Asterion at sub 50% hit points, an additional bonus action is essentially another offhand attack or poison, misty step, whatever. It should end up being more powerful than the Soul Perception. However, Asterion becomes very vulnerable because as some items that I'll show you uh, we put on later, he's going to be very squishy and you're going to want to keep him at uh, range and try to avoid him taking damage if at all. So this may lead you in some situations where he's a bit too squishy for your liking. Additionally, it's kind of difficult to maintain when you're using a build like I did with Shadowheart where you're applying a bunch of buffs with Mass Healing Word, which can potentially heal you above the 50% threshold. Finally, if you want to crit stack a little more, we don't really have any crit benefits other than the uh, sneak attack damage getting doubled, and potentially if you ascend Asterion, uh, his 1d10 necrotic damage getting doubled. But if you would like to stack crit even more, this gives you a little more dark vision, which is pretty handy. Frightening immunity, which is okay. Uh, generally, you're going to be out of range of most fear spells. And constitution saving throws, it's a nice, but the main benefit here, of course, is the uh, crit reduction. So if you want to like really see some crits, uh, this would be an option. However, I think the flat two bonus to both attack rolls, initiative, and perception is a lot stronger. For capes, uh, there are two, and I'm not sure where I put the other one, but I'll just show you here. What I used for most of the game was the dirge cape, and I don't know where it went. It, uh, I believe it's hiding from me. Um, but essentially, what the if you start as a Dark Urge, a little into uh, your long rests, you'll meet your butler and he will give you a cape that says, whenever you kill an enemy, you will gain invisibility. And this helps with positioning, moving out of opportunity attacks, uh, getting advantage early on for your attacks. However, it only procs once around, so no matter how many enemies you kill, it's only going to proc in that first time. I found that was really strong um, up until I got permanent advantage around middle act two when you get the moonrise tower uh, you can acquire permanent advantage in all your attacks in which case you'd want to run a more defensive cape although the only one i found was either the um i'm surprised i don't have any of these up here i usually do uh the the cape of defense that you buy at the very start of act two at the last light in or in act three you can put on the cloak of placement which at the start of your turn triggers and it makes enemies have disadvantage on attack rolls until you take damage which is very strong especially if you combo it with something like a defensive flourish or the shield spell which will essentially continue the disadvantage rolling for most of your turn for armor there aren't too many options at uh the first act you're also going to be a rogue to start off with so up until level four you're only going to be able to use light armor in which case, just use your favorite light armor. There's uh, a couple of them that look good. I think the most AC you're going to get is going to be maybe 13 plus your dexterity modifier. So just wear whatever you like. When you hit level 4, you're going to be able to equip medium armor. What you can do is use the adamantium scale mail from the Grim Forge. However, this is uh, not very good on a dex stacking class because it only allows you to add two dexterity to your AC as opposed to the full modifier like a couple of the other armors do. So I personally wouldn't wear this, but if you just like it or you picked it for some reason, go ahead. Uh, I intend to say that a lot with this particular armor because the medium armor kind of gets outclassed by uh, armors that'll let you add your full AC or armors with specific effects. Personally, in my playthrough, I went for the, the heavy armor for Adamantium and the uh, shield. In Act 2, the very start of the act, uh, I believe last light in, you buy this. It gives you a plus one initiative and is one of the medium armors that lets you add your full dexterity modifier to your armor class. You should have your dex gloves or have your hag hair at this point, which means you're going to have a plus four. So this will give you 19 AC, which is very high, especially for that part in the game. And plus one initiative is never a bad thing to have. Finally, when you get into, I believe, Baldur's Gate proper, uh, you can buy this, which is essentially just an upgrade. 
it's plus 17 as opposed to plus 15, and then instead of the initiative score, you get to add plus two to all of your saving throws, which is nice, but our saving throws are going to be pretty bad, so just keep that in mind. For gloves in Act 1, you can pick these up really early. They're near the Druid's Grove. They give you advantage on all side of hand checks. Make sure you have these on hand for any sort of out of combat, uh, navigating trap fields, disarming things, uh, lock picking something that's particularly difficult. You're always going to essentially want to have these in your bags just in case you need them. And they're also a fine pair of gloves to wear right, right away. Another way you can get to the Grim Forge, these just add 1d4 necrotic damage to your weapon attacks, uh, just a little more damage, which is nice. And finally, the Gloves of Archery are great until you find the Gloves of Dexterity, or if you are playing with a, uh, a Hag Hair setup, then you can pretty much wear these for most of the game. And instead of the Dexterity bonuses, they will give you a flat plus two damage to all of your ranged weapon attacks. However, as soon as you get into the crash, you can buy these, and it will set your dexterity score to 18, which means you don't have to worry about your dexterity anymore. You can feel free to go back and respec if you want to uh, get higher in other scores. Personally, I just didn't bother with that. Um, it also gives you a plus one to attack, which means a plus one to attack rolls. It's kind of odd how it's worded. And essentially, that's just plus one accuracy to all of your attacks, which effectively makes your accuracy the equivalent to someone who has 20 dexterity. I wore these the entire game, but there are some options you can get in Act 3, specifically if you are playing sort of more of a the hag hair setup. Uh, even if you are taking the second feat to cap your dexterity, or if you aren't taking your uh, the second feat to cap your dexterity. In addition, there are some bonuses, particularly there's a, if you finish the religion check by the mirror, you can get a flat plus two to your dexterity on top of anything you could be adding to your ability score. So you could potentially have 20 or 22 dexterity already without wearing the gloves, in which case setting the dexterity wouldn't benefit from that, in which case you'd want to take these off and you could wear one of these two things. If you went for the Battlemaster route, you can take these. It gives you another plus one to your attack rolls. In addition, it also gives enemies disadvantage to saving throws against your maneuvers. So this is, makes your maneuvers a lot more likely to hit. If you're not doing that, or you just want something more flat static, this gives you a plus two to your attack and damage rolls with weapons. And, but this one can only be acquired on a fully guild playthrough if you essentially escort the tieflings all the way to Act 3. For boots, you've got uh, two options. From the Underdark, if you save the, the Gnome in the Mushroom Colony, uh, she'll give you these. It's the Boots of Speed. They have the Click Heals ability, which is essentially another dash, although it does stack on top of dash, and it gives you disadvantage on opportunity attacks. It's a great sort of mobility thing. And I ended up wearing these for a bunch because the boots I'm currently wearing, I was wearing on someone else up until around Act 3. And again, these you can get in the Grim Forge off of True Soul uh, Near. They give you immunity to ensnaring and webbing and tangled, which is good because a lot of archers use the ensnare thing and it just makes you immune to that. You also can't slip on grace or ice, which is somewhat uncommon, but still relatively common. More importantly, you get Misty Step that refreshes on a short rest, and Misty Step is a very powerful spell, especially when you want to be repositioning, um, getting high ground, and moving around a lot. So personally, I think the Nightwalkers are the best boots, but another option you could have is the Evasive Shoes. They just give you plus one acrobatics and plus one AC. They're more of a straight up defensive boot that you can get at the start of Act 2 uh, if you're still using your Nightwalkers on someone else. Finally, for necklaces, the, the one is also from Act 1, and it's essentially the same as the Nightwalkers. The Amulet of Misty Step, it gives you the Misty Step spell. However, unlike most amulets that grant you spells, this one actually recharges on a short rest, which makes it very powerful, especially because you're going to be one of Misty Stepping around a lot of the time. Personally, I kept this for the entire playthrough, but I only used Asterion for a limited amount in Act 3. There are some great options you can consider. There's also another few good ones in Act 1 if you want to use the Amulet of Misty Step on someone else. The Broodmother's Revenge you get from killing Kaga or letting her die uh, via some fights. Essentially, it frees up your bonus action for instead of having to apply the poison directly yourself, it automatically gets applied when you're healed, which can synergize very well with having a mass healing word applied in your party to apply a ton of buffs. The other one that is interestingly powerful, and there's potentially a motivation for this over Misty Step even later in the game, is the Amulet of the Unworthy. You get this from the Roaming Minotaurs in the Underdark. It gives you vulnerability to bludgeoning damage, which is not great, 
but you do get resistance to slashing damage, and most of the ranged attacks you're going to be hit with are from archers and stuff, and that's all going to be slashing damage, which means you're going to be taking half damage from that. This is very strong for a lot of the game, up until you find a way to apply essentially like AoE blade wards or find resistance another way. Um, it, I just wanted to note it here. In Act 2, you can get the Subjugation Amulet, as we are going to end up with some of the later items getting a very high critical chance, especially if you're a uh, champion, if you went for that route. The Subjugation Amulet's a nice long, once per long rest thing to be able to get instant paralyze on people. Uh, very strong debuff, and we're not going to have very high DC if you try to take the whole person spell, so this is a great option to have instead. And then in Act 3, if you kill the same person who drops the Crit Helm, you can get an amulet that will automatically apply bleeding on targets with they have maximum hit points, which is great because you're almost always going to go first and you can focus one target down and then go through it and apply bleeding on the rest of them, which is great if you want to do any sort of constitution saving throws, of which there are a lot. Finally, for rings, uh, the rings are pretty set in stone, at least one of them, and you're basically looking for maximum damage here, as unlike spellcasters, there are a lot of very powerful martial rings. The first ring you're going to want to use is the Caustic Band. This is a band you can get from the Mushroom Colony at a vendor. It just applies two additional acid damage to all of your attacks. Very powerful. Um, I believe it's the second most powerful of this sort of type of ring. However, there's no stipulations on it. It's always going to be up. Acid is kind of rarely uh, resisted, unlike some other damage types. And you really don't have to think about it. It just says bonus damage. The second ring of this types is the Strange Conduit Ring that you can get by, after you fight the boss at the end of the crash. Uh, there'll be a chest that you have to make sure not to miss, because I actually did miss it and then had to go all the way back there. The chest is literally right in front of you and somehow I missed it. Um, and this is inside of it. So when you're concentrating a spell, which is very easy to do as a ranger, because you can either sit on Hunter's Mark the whole day or later pass without trace and later uh, on with a bard or a wizard, you can get some more powerful spells that you can concentrate on. And it adds a 1d4 psychic damage, which is going to even out to about the same as 2 acid damage. However, when you crit, because it's a dice roll, you'll actually get double the psychic damage than you would normally, which makes this a little stronger. However, I was using this on one of my other characters, where I, which is why I just left Vestarian with the acid band. Another great ring that you'd probably want to get and have on hand in Act 1 uh, it's around where the Gloves of Thieving are, I believe, it is this, the Smuggler's Ring. It's going to reduce your Charisma score, however, it's going to give you plus two Stealth and plus two Sleight of Hand, which is great, because those are two checks you're going to be making a lot as a Rogue, and plus two is a very strong bonus, especially to have early on. You're going to want to have this sitting in your bags next to your Gloves of Thievery whenever something's particularly difficult, or you know there's going to be a stretch of long, like, non-combat scouting going on. You're going to want to throw it on. You can also just leave it on if you don't feel like you need the bonus damage. Finally, in Act 2, uh, you can find this, I believe it's in like a crypt somewhere or something. It gives you blind immunity. Blind immunity is very strong if you're running any sort of darkness abusing comp. You can run this and then have Shadowheart use her spear and then have a warlock with the invocation that lets them see in Devil's Sight. And then potentially in Act 3, you get the helmet that gives someone else uh, magical dark sight and then just run around in darkness for the rest of the game. That is a lot more powerful than the Caustic Band because not only do you get the advantage on attacks, but you also get disadvantage on people attacking you in the darkness. And a lot of times you won't even be able to be targeted because there's a 10 meter range on uh, people that are hiding in the darkness. So this is great if you're going for that sort of setup. However, the, the one ring that I would buy, rush to Moonrise Towers, buy this right away, don't even take it off, is the Risky Ring. The Risky Ring, I believe the, the Blood Lady sells it. It gives you advantage on all of your attack rolls, which means you're always gonna be proccing sneak attack. Even with Sharpshooter on, your attack is pretty much going to be a 99% chance to hit the entire time. As soon as you get this and hit level 8, you're going to be firing off 4 attacks with advantage every round, and it is preposterously powerful. The downside is pretty major. You do receive disadvantage on saving throws. However, as a uh, more ranged focus character, you can avoid a lot of AoE spells. You're not going to be targeted as often. Uh, but it is a real thing to keep in mind. You're also going to lose concentration a lot more often than you would normally. That's it for the rings. I would generally pick Risky Ring and one Damage Ring, unless you are using the Eversight Ring for that specific setup. For weapons, uh, let's just do the ranged weapons first, because these are going to be your main weapons. 
the start of the game. They're a little hard to find, but try and find two hand crossbows. Once you get a second hand crossbow, you are going to be able to wield them in your main and offhand. And this allows you to make an offhand ranged attack with your bonus action, which is very powerful. And especially when you hit Thief at level three, you're going to be able to make two offhand attacks with your bonus action, which means you get three attacks around as easily as level three, which is a lot more than most other marshals get. In Act 2, there's two things you can get in Moonrise Towers, which again, beeline there. If you leave the initial vendor area and uh, destroy a wall, the Nair Misser will be in a chest hidden in the wall. Uh, it does force damage, which is only resisted by a couple enemies in the game, and usually they're either resistant to everything except for force damage or weak to force damage, which means the damage type on this is actually very powerful. In addition, you get the Magi Magical Missile spell for free at level 3, which fires 5. However, I tended not to use this a lot because it takes your full action when you could just make two attacks. Uh, keep in mind, it is something that you have available to you, however. Additionally, at the end of the temple, um, you can find this if you go through the Raphael quest line. Uh, you can find this uh, down in a hidden lair over there. This is the best hand crossbow in the game. It's a plus two magical weapon, which gives you plus two to damage and attacks. Additionally, it has a chance to inflict burning if you're hitting someone while hiding or invisible. Uh, this comboed very well with the Dark Urge cape that I was using at the time. Uh, however, burning is not a uh, particularly strong debuff, so your mileage may vary. Additionally, you get access to the Scorching Ray Shot, which is nice, especially because it's 8d6, which means once per short rest, you can blast someone with fire damage. And generally, this may be better than two... Uh, auto attacks with your crossbow weapon, so just keep it in mind as an option, particularly if you're able to find an enemy that's weak to fire or turn them weak to fire via arsonist oil or something else. Uh, finally, for main hands, uh, I'm going to go over the main hands and then talk about the off hands. Uh, main hand, generally just use whatever you'd like. However, in Act 1, once you get to the crash, the quartermaster there sells this. You're going to buy it. It's your best in slot main hand for the entire game. Not only does it increase your crit range by one, but it also lets you reroll damage, um, essentially similar to the Savage Attacker and the Great Weapon Master, or Great Western uh, Fighting Style. It lets you reroll your damage, which includes all your sneak attacks and everything. So it's a little, it gives you a little more than just getting the crit reduction. I didn't find the Shadow Blade worked. I think that only works for uh, when you are melee attacking with this weapon, but uh, your mileage may vary. But get this, put it on, don't ever take it off. It's also a plus two weapon, so if you want to start using like melee attacks then, or you find yourself in melee range and you don't really want to get an opportunity attack, it's still a great weapon to attack with. For offhands, you have a couple options. At the start of the game in Act 1, uh, you aren't going to be able to use shields, so just equip whatever offhand you'd like, and that'll let you make a bonus action attack before you've found your two hand crossbows. Later in the game, once you've hit level 4 and you've taken a level in Ranger, you're going to start equipping shields. So I recommend just equipping any shield you find. Any green shield with a bonus is fine, or just a normal shield. What I ended up using for most of the game was the Adamantium shield. This gives you a little reaction thing, which is good because we normally don't have a lot of reactions outside of the uh, opportunity attack. It makes you crit immune, and when an attacker misses you, they get a minus one to their attacks with the railing debuff. I kept this on pretty much up until I found it offhand. Um, the immune to crits is very powerful. Railing's a strong debuff. Um, but you do have to keep in mind, when you make your attacks for the round, you're going to be using your crossbows. So at the very end of the round, before you end your turn, you want to swap back. Just make sure instead of seeing him using his crossbows, you want to click on this so that he's using a sword and a shield, and then end your turn. This way you'll be able to benefit from the additional AC as, all the, as well as all the other benefits. In Act 2, there are some other shields you can use if you didn't like the Adamantium shield. There's the Sentinel shield that you can, I believe, buy from Moonrise Towers. It's another plus 3 to AC and advantage on perception checks. Aggression, sorry, not AC, Initiative. Initiative is a very strong buff to have because of how it works. You can also get the Iron Bandit shield next to the... Um, the Hobgoblin Merchant, you just have to be able to sneak and steal in a room full of people. So this is where the Fog Cloud or Invisibility comes in handy. Just beware, if you're using Invisibility, the roaming eyeballs do have Invisibility Sight, so you want to make sure you're avoiding their patrols if you're going to do that. Finally, in Act 3, we have our final endgame offhand. It drops off of um, 
the doppelganger boss at the Temple of Baal at the very end. Uh, it's a pretty tough fight, especially if you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, which I would recommend doing as a dirge because it's a lot of fun. You get this, and when it's used in your offhand, you get plus one AC, so it's sort of a half shield. In addition to when a creature misses you, you can attack with advantage. That's just what True Strike is. True Strike also doesn't knock off your concentration. I double checked that. Uh, even though the cantrip is concentration, this repost won't knock off your concentration. It also gives you a, an increased crit range, which will stack with Knife of the Mountain King and Champion or the Helm. Uh, that's all the items. Uh, I would also recommend trying to get haste on if you can, using a post niche speed. Uh, haste is very powerful on this Asterian build in particular, just because of how much uh, raw attacks and attack damage you can do, in addition to having an easier time proccing the Elixir of Bloodlust. 